Welcome back. This is the task force on affordable, accessible health care. Representative Lippert and I are Senator Alliance, our co chairs, and we are very happy to have um, Mike Fisher, our chief health care advocate, with us this afternoon. Mike, thank you for being here. Good afternoon. Good to be here. Do you want to? Um, share with us what it is that your office sure. is doing and yeah I, so I'm, I'm mike fisher i'm the um, chief healthcare advocate a, a position that defines the state statute and um before i and I, I i do came here prepared to talk about a project that we're in the middle of and really to give you an update about it um a medical debt storytelling project it really is uh, very well timed for the conversation you are in for the purposes of this this committee. Um, but before I started, I, I guess I just wanted to make a high level comment. Um, I, I've been a student of the challenge of how do you bring consumer voices to the legislative table appropriately for a long time. And there's no really good, easy answer to it. Public hearings are an answer. Um, and um, and uh, and so I guess I wanted to sort of recognize this moment and recognize the challenges that your committee has with five meetings to find, the limitations, the very clear limitations of that. Um, and I think, you know, it's part of my statute is to bring consumer voices forward. And, uh, and that's what I'm doing here today. It's not a replacement for real life human people, um, uh, but it is a step in the right direction, I think. So. Yeah. So I will go ahead and share my screen and um, and get it on the right mode. I hope I've turned off all of the messaging services so that you don't <laughs> see um, my advocates who are who are sitting in a hospital budget hearing at this moment and maybe chatting about it. Um, I do have paper copies of this, if anybody would like one. I, I, I wouldn't I mind like having one. one. Why, don't we, why don't we all take one? Mm. Yes, we do you. have it on our iPad. I want to introduce um, on Zoom is Meg Polit. Um, you all know as former chief of staff for uh, Governor Ackerman, uh, who work is working with us on this project. And um, to the extent you have sort of specific questions about what's going on, I'll call on Meg and uh, and I may call on Meg to say a little bit about sort of her experience in getting to know this subject issue because she has sort of fresh eyes. Um, here's my agenda for the day, pretty straightforward. Um, I want to, oh man, I want to stop sharing. Mm, can you give me just a minute? I apologize. I have the wrong one pulled up. I recognize that person on Zoom. Welcome, Meg. Good to see you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for this hard work that you're doing. It's wonderful to be here on a screen. I wish I was there with you. Next time. All right, I'm gonna to have to do it this way. Um, all right, I need to get back to... Is it something Charlene can help with? I think I'm there. Okay. Oh. Share screen. Okay. 
apologies. Uh, it's maybe not as good as it could have been, but it's what I got. Um, so uh, let me just um, uh, recognize the, the pictures, uh, the people on, on um, slide two. Um, uh, I, I'm not alone. I have a whole team behind me, uh, people who are um, working on, um, who are part of my team, who are, answering, who are on the phone answering questions and who are, and I, and, and I also have to recognize as I look at this picture, how outdated it is. We haven't been in person for a little while. <laughs> Um, a, a little shameless uh, promotion. Um, the uh, um, the HCA helpline is open. Uh, uh, this is one of my advocates, Anna Lee. Um, she is not in a cubicle in Burlington, in the north end of Burlington. She is uh, at at home at the moment, but working just the same. Um, and um, uh, we're, we're available, and people are. Um, reaching out to us today, like every day. Are there people at the office in Burlington? <clears throat> um, a few. Yeah, there's okay. A few. So what do we know about medical debt data? Um, you know, nationally, just uh, last month, uh, JAMA produced a, a new analysis that found that there was a, a $140 billion of unpaid medical bills that were at collection agencies. Um, here in Vermont, um, in 2019, the hospitals reported to the Green Mountain Care Board that there was $85 million of consumer uh, bad debt uh, that had been uncollected. Um, <clears throat> the 2020 data, I do have the 2020 data. I didn't put it on here. It ticked down a touch, 81 million or something. Um, 2020 data, you guys, when you're looking at what's going on in healthcare and probably everything, we're gonna to have to put a big asterisk next to 2020. As a percent of um, net patient revenue, it didn't tick down, but the actual number did. Um, you talked a little bit about the House Health Insurance Survey earlier today. In the 2018 uh, survey, it found 40% of Vermonters who were had commercial plans were underinsured. Um, the, the survey is indeed about, I, I believe it's about to be finalized um, and to go out into the field uh, shortly. I, uh, we engaged, as did others, in the actual questions being asked this year. Um, I think that it's a better, it's, a, it's been improved. I think there will be some questions that will get at a lot of what you guys have talked about today, um, important stuff. We have always gotten calls about medical debt, the helpline, and they fall broadly into two categories, <clears throat> um, calls for which we can do something about. Uh, they, and, and the examples are so technical. Somebody, you know, a, a visit got coded wrong, a, um, a, uh, any number of problems that can happen along the way that leads to a medical bill. And so many of them we can do something about, many of them we can't, um, either because they are too old, past the period of time where we can intervene, um, um, or because everything was done according to the law, the rules, and yet someone still desperate in front of us saying, I just can't pay this bill. Um, the, the medical debt storytelling project is um, uh, sort of runs along, it was inspired largely by what we saw at the helpline and what we've been hearing out in the field. Um, but it is, there's no overlap between the medical debt storytelling project and our helpline work. We kept them at arm's length the role that we play as an advocate for somebody and trying to help them solve their problems is really different than the role we're playing in collecting stories and presenting them to, to you. And it makes sense to us to just keep them separate. Um, this is a non-representative survey, really clear. Any data I give you about who called us and what, you know, what percentage them are this or that or the other thing is 
just a recognition of the people who self-identified and called us. Um, and, um, and we did take a lot of information um, about um, age and insurance status and race and income and residence and more. Um, and um, so we will be able to tell you something about who, who we're talking about. Um, welcome, Senator. Um, Thank you for saying that. You beat me to it. <coughs> welcome, Senator. Sorry. <laughs> we, we, we understand. <laughs> we understand. Um, that did not help. It's a health care <laughs> issue. <so>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, sorry. That's okay, I, I interrupted. Um, I looked at the number just now. Um, it, I think we're up to uh, 1930 or some people have participated. Yes, Senator? Um, does someone have to speak English to take the survey? Um, no, we do uh, invite people to, um, to, to, we gave a phone number, we gave various ways so that we could respond to did you get any survey responses in other languages? Um, I, uh, Meg, are you uh, were you able to hear that question? I don't believe I, so. I did hear the question. We we did not get other responses specifically in other languages, but we definitely got responses from non English speakers. I'm not sure if you'll see some examples in what Mike's going to present to you, but very clearly when people identified from other. Uh, races and countries, you could tell their English in their own words was they were struggling with the words to answer the questions. Okay, so verbal interview where if there was limited English proficiency. Exactly. Okay. Um, and and in, in addition, we did a, a little bit of a targeted outreach to try and make sure we had a, a as diverse as we could um, group of people who at least knew about the survey. Um, a surprising number of people. I just want to sort of recognize we were blown away here. Um, we knew we were going to hear some horror stories and we knew we were going to hear some passionate stories. Um, but um, I had no idea. And I thought we'd get a couple dozen that, you know, we could sort of tell you, here's, a, here's what people are saying out there, you know, to have almost 2,000 people respond. And, um, and certainly some people filled out the survey and gave us very little information. But many, many people gave us, spent a lot of time and really told us uh, in their own words what's going on. And um, that's sort of the most important part of this it is that it's an opportunity to advance people's voices um, so that, um, uh, let, me, let me just say there's two main goals that motivated us here. One, and I'm not sure exactly what the order is as I sit here right now. One of them is certainly to make sure policymakers know about this and to try and affect changes instead changes that will reduce medical debt. Um, and the other one is um, people live in isolation about this issue, embarrassed, feeling horrible about the dynamic um, and um, and we really wanted to uh, do what we could to reduce the stigma. I think people feel a sense of individual blame about something that I would assert is a structural problem. It's not people's fault that they got sick. That's what we're talking about here. People got sick or had an accident, didn't have a Cadillac plan, afford a Cadillac plan, and therefore have um, medical debt and um, and I really want to send as clear a message um, and we need we have some work to do I'm going to ask your advice a little bit about how to do some of this um, it really getting the work out, saying saying to people hey you're not alone uh, and this is not your fault this is really so that, a structural that does problem. raise a question about how you publicize the survey in the first place mm -hmm. and then so the next step will be letting people know some of the concerns that you have about reducing stigma and yeah. redu redu blame reduction. Yeah. How did you get the survey out? So we did, and Meg, <laughs> jump in where I'd miss, uh, we did press releases 
worked everywhere we could. We uh, approached um, every group we could think of that could get it out to their members. Um, we did a uh, paid ad on Front Porch Forum, almost statewide. Um, and, and, and we reached out to all of you legislators as well, and many of you shared it um, on social media and email newsletters and um, on Front Porch Forum yourself directly to your constituents. A relatively high number of people said that we could share their stories. That also surprised me. I expected a lot of people to say, ah, you know, I'll tell you, but I don't really want you to tell the details of my life. And 87%, um, uh, we have a lot we have a tremendous amount of work to do to, uh, to get through this, I think I'm ahead of my slides, uh, to get through this and to, and to develop the themes and to be able to make a, uh, a summary and a report about it. Um, this is just a slide to say it's still open, it's still open through the end of the month so people can participate still. Um, <clears throat> the end of August. Yes. Thank you, to the end of August. Um, and this is, I, I started to say this already. We have a, we, a great deal of work to do. I mean, for instance, the, the race field, we decided it made most sense to let it be a text field, not give people boxes they had to check off. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so we now have the work of going through and um, defining that in a way that makes sense. That's interesting. Because my question was going to be, I mean, this is, all, you know, obviously very compelling. It's all qualitative. It's, it's really hard to say we were, we had a goal of getting 10% BIPOC participation in a survey, because you have no idea, and then making sure that you're yeah. properly categorizing people so you know if there's a disparity. Well, um, yes, you're right. Um, I, there's two things I want to say. One of them is um, uh, we understood that even if we had X percent of the people who fed off a survey were BIPOC, that we wouldn't be able to, say, to extrapolate from there about the experience of BIPOC people in Vermont mm -hmm. versus white people in Vermont. Um, so that's one part of the answer. You still might set a goal to say we want to make sure this voices, we're understanding the yeah. unique stories from these voices. Yeah, I think all will, you're right. I think what we'll be able to do is report to you um, how much participation we had. Okay. Um, and um, yeah. Meg, do you have anything to add on that point? I would, I would just say you're correct. We knew from the get-go that we weren't, we weren't trying to get a representative story. We were trying to get stories to show, show the picture. We did reach out to, and this was shared by both of the NAACP chapters as well as Migrant Justice um, to their members and rural Vermont, all touching some of the um, BIPOC groups in Vermont, but there's so much more. And I think the language issue is huge. And we just knew we didn't, ha we, we didn't have the resources in this project to do a survey that would take all of that into account, which would really have to be going out and reaching all people and asking them about their experience to put this into a category. But I can tell you for sure that in that uh, race, race ethnicity field, there is a, a wide variety of how people have self-identified themselves from different countries to different regions to colors. Um, so there's definitely stuff in there and we will be able to pull out at least what percentage we heard from using this tool, which was really primarily an online tool. So we offered people print, we offered people verbal, but most of the ways we were advertising it was through some form of online engagement. So we know we missed huge swaths of people. Yeah. And then I'll also remind you that the household health insurance survey is a representative survey. It's a high quality survey and it does have, I believe, though I haven't seen the final draft, I believe it will have medical debt question in it. And that may give a little bit more of a, an ability to understand how, you know, how does medical debt, um, how people across different groups in Vermont experience me medical debt. Well, when you do an initial qualitative analysis, then it does help you identify places that are unclear 
mm -hmm. or where the gaps are. So that would that could direct you in the future, but it could also direct you, as you said, to other surveys that are going on and yep. where those gaps might be filled in. We've only gone through 400 surveys so far, a little bit in preparation for today's meeting. Uh, again, we have close to 2,000 to do. Um, and uh, and we, we generally see them into the, in these categories that I've listed here, access to healthcare, affordability, impact on daily life, surprise, and collections. And I want to also recognize my bias here. I and others are interested in the impacts of medical debt on people's ability to heat their homes or, or put gas in the car. That's really important. I'm most interested here in the impacts of medical debt on people's ability to get the care they need. Um, so uh, that's sort of the, the main question that I was really curious about. You know, again, I'll use that number, $85 million in medical debt in 2019. What does that mean? And, and I, I'm sorry, $85 million that hospitals recorded in 2019. Hospitals were, are about 40% of the healthcare system. So, you know, you, you, and I don't think it would be correct to just multiply out to, you know, it, um, you know, to the other parts of the healthcare system, but, um, but medical debt is, um, but anyway, I'm trying to, to get it to, to boil this down into real human stories. Well, but when you do that, it also helps us to identify, to define affordability. Yeah. Because if people can't afford to heat their homes or feed their families, there's there's the cutoff. Yeah, I it, um, I think Senator, um, we talk a lot in healthcare reform about the right care at the right time, mm -hmm. and um, and I think the question, you know, I think I know what happens to people when they owe their hospital or their provider, you know, five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars or a high percentage of their income. Um, when they need to go to the doctor. I think I know what happens to people, but I really wanted to hear it in people's own words. But wrapped up in that, a lot of these stories are about people foregoing care because someone else in their family needs it more. So is that in the same vein for you? It, it, it is. And, and it's an interesting, um, thank you for saying that. It wasn't exactly on my mind mm -hmm. when we asked the question um, that um, it wasn't just of course, your own experience, it is people within your economic unit. You know, if, you're, if your husband is experienced, uh, has a lot of medical that, that it impacts you or your kids. Um, we wanted to demonstrate, we wanted to put some real words in front of you and um, <clears throat> wanted to demonstrate the statewideness of this. Um, and so we just picked one, um, one quote from each county. And I'm just gonna go ahead and make a decision. I'm gonna read. Addison County. My wife has ep epilepsy and she prays every night she doesn't have a seizure because my insurance would not cover any of the costs. It was from a male 18 to 26 insured. From Bennington. The premium for my health insurance is manageable, but, not the, but the deductible is not. I'm in chronic pain, but have to pay out of pocket care, out of pocket for the care I need. Female, 41 to 64 insured. Caledonia, for years I went to the doctors, went to doctors, dentists, etc., for major emergencies only because lack of affordable insurance also would skip on necessary prescriptions for the same reasons. Female uninsured. Are you saying a percentage of uh, females as compared with males or is it pretty equal? You don't know yet. I don't think we know that yet. It's an interesting question. Yeah. Chindon, I'm postponing medical treatments because I'm in the deductible period and cannot afford to use my private health insurance. Essex, 
My income is Social Security, so I can barely afford Medicare Part B. Supplemental insurance and Part D, which now cost me $320 a month. Monthly medications are approximately $1,000, my cost. And I was in the proverbial donut hole in May. Franklin, husband owed $50 to primary care physician that he couldn't pay, would not go see him about his GI issues because he felt bad and worried they wouldn't see him with a past due balance. Grand Isle, I have suffered pain in my feet so that I am forced to be less active, causing my health to suffer further simply cannot afford these high medical bills, even with the insurance deduction. Lamoille, I, I have several serious conditions, but try not to go to the doctor because it's too expensive to see all the specialists I need. My husband had two emergencies last year that were more urgent, so I try to go without care. Orange, today, every decision is looked at with an eye to the financial consequences, not to quality of life or even length of life. Orleans, living paycheck to paycheck, I didn't have an extra month's worth of rent and utilities to pay for the medical bill. I avoided going to a primary care physician. Rutland. I put off going to the doctors for as long as I can, hoping things improve on their own. I was supposed to go to a surgeon to discuss diver diverticulitis, but have put it off for at least six months, knowing I do not have any extra funds for the appointment or surgery. Washington. I can't acquire more medical debt and put off basic debt tests until affordable and sure of coverage. And Wyndham. My son's type one diabetes care is so expensive, myself and my other son can't afford to go to the doctor. And Windsor. I constantly put off care. I have insurance, but never know what my obligations will be. Once you enter, enter the medical system, it's a black hole of expense. Gary. I guess I um I guess I wanted to just pause for a second and um, recognize um, I just want to pause for a second let the, let it sink in for all of us um, so I, I I live in this world of talking to people about their challenges of access to care um, every day and um, I hear the, um, I'll say, um, secondary trauma that my advocates experience as they um, attempt to help people. Um, um, so there was, as I've paged through the responses, I can't tell you that there's anything I've heard that individually was all that shocking or surprising or I hadn't heard before. But there is something uh, immense about the sheer volume here. We touched a nerve. And um, so, um, Meg, I, I, maybe I'll ask you to say a sentence or two about, Meg has done more than anybody of actually reading what's come in. So I, I would, I'd welcome a, a sentence or two from you, Meg, about your experience with it. 
Yeah, well, I think, um, thank you for letting me speak for a second and, and hello to everybody in the room. Um, I think you all know that I've also been involved in the world of medical healthcare, medical coverage and these issues for a long time, but I was in no way prepared um, for what I took on in, in offering to gather and go through this information. And um, I think I'll just say three things have really, really struck me from this. One, it is so hard to read the volume of what we've received. It, um, from, as Mike said, we've only, I've only gone through 400 surveys before so far. Um, it seems like about 30% of them are telling a story um, from what I'm looking at. So that's a lot of information where people are telling their personal um, trials and challenges. The second is I was shocked by how many people are foregoing other necessities um, because of it. Like I would say every single survey people, we had a choice where people could check things that they've had to um, forego to pay for their medical debt. And the list was you know, relatively long from things like electricity, heat, childcare, transportation. I think there are about 12 things on the list. I would say every single survey has one or two of those checked and some have six to eight of them checked. Um, and the third thing was how, how accepting people seem to be of this debt and that they're very willing to pay it. They're, they, they automatic, you know, there's things that people say, like, you know, it, you know, I know I had to pay my bill, even if it made it harder for my kids to have something to eat, like that, the something in our society and something about the fact that people know they got treated and they're grateful for the care they're getting makes them very, they want to do what's right. They don't want to walk out on it, but they're strapped in that they just don't have the resources. So um, it's going to take a while to go through all the other ones um, and, and find the pieces, but I'm anticipating that at the end, you know, you would see quotes like we just saw, you know, hundreds of them, maybe five, six, 700 quotes, like what we just saw, just to give you an idea of, of, of the volume um, that we're seeing and how concise and articulate people are sharing their, their story and the problem. So as you're looking through all of the information that you have, are you able to get some specificity around uh, socioeconomic status for any of the folks, uh, income levels, uh, that kind of information that would uh, tell us a little bit more about the relationship between the insurance premium or the hospital charge and then what people people are actually capable of supporting. So we did collect income, self-reported income information. So we, we will be able to break it down in that way. Um, and we did collect insurance status. So we'll be able to break it down in that way as well. Terrific. Yeah, I would just say once the survey closes and we put it in a database, because right now we're liter I'm literally just going through surveys, so I can't sort on all the different criteria. But as Mike said, we, we collected a lot, so we will be able to look. We also had an open-ended field on the amount of debt that people have, and it ranges from you know, people who put something like $127.32 in to people that put more than 50000 So that field we need to go through and add up, but we will be able to get a self-reported total of what people are saying. And then again, because we sorted on county, we had county reporting, we could take it down to the county level and, and break out, you know, debt per county or income levels per county. We can break it by gender, gender and uh, in, including um, that was self-identified so people could be trans female, trans male, non-binary, as well as male and female. Um, so there's a lot of ways that once it's in the database, we'll be able to extract and pull uh, clearer pictures of what that looks like out. But right now I'm, I'm just looking through them, the 400 I've gone through and grabbing the, the quotes out. Thank you. Can I say that one of the things that I'm struck by as well, I keep sitting here thinking, I think I understand it correctly, but these are folks who are, don't have access to Medicaid. 
So because if you were on Medicaid, mm -hmm. theoretically, you right. wouldn't have this medical debt. But you could be at that point of socioeconomic status where you might have been on Medicaid at one point and no longer on Medicaid, or you might be eligible for Medicaid at another point in time. It's that it's the, mm -hmm. but, but that there's a whole, because we have a high percentage of Vermonters who actually access their healthcare through Medicaid, Vermont Medicaid. Right. That's a whole world of people who could be very well in this same situation or worse or as bad mm -hmm. if it weren't for what we provide through Medicaid. Yeah. But for Medicaid and for a Medicaid expansion scheme, and you think in, 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 in the think about Vermont, but that's well over 100,000 Vermont right. who are not in this survey because of this. Not to say that's oh, very such a good job, but just to think how much greater yeah. the potential is for people to be suffering from medical death. Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the thought that comes up for me in response is um, this question of um, sort of what drives behaviors here. And, um, you know, when, you know, we asked the question a little bit broader um, about sort of medical debt in your sphere, you know, you know, like if you grew up in a family where your family was fighting medical debt, you know, like your parents were struggling with medical debt their entire lives, how does that, you know, does, does it impact? You're, you're thinking, we want people to get care, right? That's the goal here. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we, we frame it in terms of preventative care to, uh, to you know, getting to your primary care doc so that you have better outcomes and don't cost the system more. Um, um, but so sort of how does the legacy of medical debt in people's families impact them? And I think that's the one, that's the one caveat I would come up with. You know, I think people who are on Medicaid, some of that, pe people are not exactly rational thinkers. I'm gonna to go to the example of how many people have switched to uh, um, a Vermont Health Connect plan that has much higher subsidies. You know, we have, we have a hard time getting people to do things that are in their own economic interest sometimes. Um, so I, I, I think um, it's a backdrop in a lot of people's minds uh, that, is a, a wind that pushes in exactly the opposite direction of what we're all trying to do in healthcare reform. I have a quick question. Um, on the insurance question, are you just asking insured uninsured? Are you asking what type of insurance? We, we ask what type of insurance. Okay, yeah. And I, I was remind us it's all self-reported. I, I, I think. Uh, uh, sometimes policymakers have a hard time distinguishing between Medicaid and Medicare. I think, I think people do as well. Uh, a lot of people talk about chronic pain and kind of uh, chronic issues. And I recall from talking to the chief medical examiner in West Virginia when I was there looking mm -hmm. at the fear crisis mm -hmm. and overdose death rate. He said, you know, so much of what we've tried to do with opioids is treat pain, but what really people are trying to treat is suffering. Mm -hmm. And if they can't get a knee replacement, they can't fix their teeth, they can't get care that is for a chronic issue, they would likely turn to opioids to manage a, a suffering instead of pain. And it just strikes me how much suffering we see here that isn't like I can go to the doctor and you know, get surgery, a lot of it is I'm gonna be in chronic pain for the rest of my life. I don't know what to do, I, I can't manage that. I don't know the way to sort of get more detail about those stories and what people do to cope and how expensive that can end up being for all of us. Yeah, uh, thanks for that. I, I, I would just add, add to what you just said, dental. Mm -hmm. um, um, many of the stories of chronic pain are dental yeah. stories. And, and many of the access to care challenges are dental stories. Um, um, but you also said something about getting a more, um, uh, a richer, uh, you didn't use the word, but a more detailed story. Um, and uh, it's something that we have entertained 
-hmm. whether we, we could um, go a little bit deeper with a smaller set of people uh, to get a more full story. And um, we're still figuring that out exactly. Right. I, I, I also wanna recognize I, at some point, Jeremy Lippert asked me across the table two years ago or something, how does the healthcare advocate decide what the healthcare advocate focuses on? And I have an answer that was something like, well, we, you know, we, you know, we, we have the information that comes in through the helpline, that's primary. And, you know, I've got a great team and we sit on every board and commission that you guys dream up or I have dreamed up in past years. And, um, uh, um, and, um, and we read a lot and we look at what other states are doing. Um, but there's something, this is a new way for us to interact with Vermonters. Um, this doesn't demonstrate it a little bit, you know, you know, nobody ever calls the healthcare advocate's office and says, I went to the doctor and I got treated and my insurance company worked exactly according to plan. You know, we ne <laughs> we're never going to hear those stories. Uh, and those stories are clearly out there. Um, but um, this is an experiment, one I hope to do much more of, of um, picking areas of healthcare where um, not just waiting for people to call us, but we, but we need to reach out and hear more directly. And, and I actually, I have to say, it's been on my mind and I really need to figure out who to partner with um, to really hear uh, uh, firsthand stories of race disparities, right? How people are treated, um, how BIPOC people are treated when they get care. It's, uh, it's, some... it's really interesting because so many uh, medical clinics and hospitals now are doing patient satisfaction surveys. Mm -hmm. And I would think that insurance companies might be doing that as well. Yeah. I don't know if there's any way to access that information. Some of it's good and some of it's bad. Yeah. Overall. Well, um, to the uh, race, uh, is there race data in those surveys? Um, is a question that's always been on, on my mind and one that I uh, have asked and never got a really good answer about. Um, so what is the timing on this? So obviously, I, I think this does inform our work. Um, it would be helpful to see some of the analysis that you folks are doing and, and what comes of it. But So the, the survey closes at the end of this month of August and, and, you know, we will work to pull together uh, summaries, and, you know, uh, presentations about it, takeaways um, for you for the legislative session. Um, will it be in time to come back with a, uh, a report to us? Before, um, it will, would you have that analysis done, say by November or December? I, I, I will. I will have something to you whenever you ask for it. Um, my depth of analysis will be uh, will be more. I I, I will. I, I um, just to give you a little insight into sort of my life. I've just climbed out of the hole that is. Uh, maybe I should say the ring that is insurance rate review, and my team has been to our eyeballs in that. We're not even done. Um, the, a decision has been made, but there's still motions for floating around. And uh, so that's still happening. And as I referenced this week and next week is hospital budgets. And um, right. that's a, um, a tremendous effort for my team and also of tremendous importance when we're talking about the cost of our system. Um, I wonder if I could spend just a minute responding to a few things that have been said this morning. Um, a few thoughts that are on my mind that I wanted to um, I wanted to, uh, um, Chairman Lippert um, mentioned a few things that other states have done, and I wanted to add, I want to agree with him on those and add, um, I think Colorado has done some very interesting. Can I be clear? I was not trying to list all the interesting mm. things that I well, think we should learn. There's lots of things. Please. Oh, Oregon, Colorado, yeah. Maryland. <laughs> um, and I think I'm not sure whether Representative Donnelly was exactly going here, but um, uh, the Medicare Savings Program eligibility yeah. is is, exactly. is a, a place where the state has some options. Maine has done some something interesting that I think mm -hmm. we should at least bust out. Um, 
I want to be clear, these are nibbling around the edge of things. These, these are, this is in the, in the realm of things that I think are, well, Colorado might be a bigger step, but things that I think are reasonable, certainly reasonable to entertain. Um, I would phrase the New Mexico story a little bit differently. I think it's a New Mexico style way of raising money and applying that money um, to improve access. Um, they did something a little bit broader than just um, waive mental health co-pays for fully insured people. Um, that I think is worth looking at. <clears throat> um, I want to remind us all that we have something like $500 million of ARPA monies that have not yet been um, allocated or um, identified where they're going to be spent. And, um, and I know there's a tremendous amount of need everywhere, and I sure hope that at least some of that goes uh, directly to consumer access to care. And um, would have proposals to put on the table about that. Um, um, I, I want to recognize, I'm not sure I've ever heard it said at a legislative hearing, I understand why there's a tremendous amount of effort that's put into attention that's put into people who sit in emergency departments for mental health conditions. Um, there is another, I'm not sure if it's equal or smaller, or there's another tremendous issue playing out in our hospitals today, and that's people in hospitals who are subacute, maybe even in custodial level needing of care, who are awaiting skilled nursing facility placement for which there are none. For somebody who has a behavioral, uh, who's been violent, or somebody who um, has a drug addiction issue, it, it's, you just can't place them. And those people sit in hospital rooms, um, spending us spending a lot of money, and and, I, and it's sort of similar to the mental health one. It's a structural problem. You know, do we need places that are designed to take the pressure off of hospitals? UVM told us the other day that there were something like thirty or forty people on that day. That's right. In in beds. And and the workforce issue plays a huge role in across all of them. Yeah. And then because long-term care was mentioned, yeah. a Washington style long-term care funding, um, Washington state style is something that um, is maybe a little bit outside of the health frame of this committee, but um, I, I can't help but mention it because I think it's really cool when I see states doing, stepping up and doing some really innovative things. And, then I, and I can't help but mention there are also bills on the committee on, on the healthcare committees all that um, you know particularly focus on um, on how much hospitals uh, uncompensated care uh, really belong in the bad debt category and really and how much of it really should reasonably be put in the free care category. I'm not talking about increasing the amount of money that hospitals don't collect from people. Um, I would like to reduce that, um, but um, we see plenty of evidence across the hospital system where there's um, where people who are economically eligible or low enough income to qualify for the free care policies, but who are roped out of those systems um, using things like duration, durational residency requirements or hospital level residency requirements um, or, or other ones that frankly we worry have a race equity concern. Go ahead, so, I apologize for being late. Maybe some of this was said. I think this is a good start, but what I don't really get is, is um, what the picture is of the people that are in this category. Is it just, is it mostly working for? Would you mind speaking into the mic because with your mask on the chart here? Um, Thank you. I, I'm I'm trying to figure out what this population looks like mm. because as you throw out solutions to that, that um, what I'm shooting at for a group of people, um, what those solutions might be would be different in each of us. Is this working for? Um, um, 
uh, are these people that have some insurance and it's high deductible and and, and that breakdown in that would yeah. would help me through figuring out what I'm talking about. Um, and and will there, as you go further in this survey, will this be broken down further so I get a better picture of what the categories of people are in this? Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, uh, we certainly will be able to give some more insight about the people who filled out the survey, how many, you know, what percentage of them or what percentage of the debt um, was for people who are uninsured versus insured with a high deductible. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that and, that, that, and, and, and will I find out how many are working and not working? Because my sense is you're, this is all pretty much adult population that is, mm -hmm. and it sounds like working poor to me. Yeah, and by income. So I think, it, um, I'm not exactly sure. So I think you can extrapolate from that working poor, um, but we did not ask a question about employment. We did ask about income, and we, and we did it in, in, in income range. We don't, we have sort of uh, pockets that people place themselves in. Okay, but that picture would be helpful to me. And, um, and I'll, I'll anecdotally say, I've had um, three employers come up to me in the last week that are um, one that owns a small bakery. And um, they feel lost to be able, and they want to help employees, but they don't, our information is kind of all over the place. And there's nobody for them to really sit down with and have a, a talk with to, for them to help. I, 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 I want to, I want to echo exactly the last thing you said is, is a really, uh, really important point and one that troubles me. Um, I'm a consumer advocate. My office is a consumer advocate's office. We're not a small business people's advocate and we get calls mm -hmm. from people who are saying, ah, I'm trying to sort this out. And we help, sometimes I help them to take it out of the realm of the advocates. Um, but, but, um, role is a bit different, and it troubles me greatly that um, the people that are available to give advice to those people often are trying to sell them something. Mm -hmm. Not saying they're not getting giving great advice and getting great options. Um, I'm just saying that there isn't a counterpart to me that gives small businesses um, uh, the best advice they can about their employee benefit options. Hmm. Should there be? Without there being sales. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, if you're trying to compare between that world and you're um, running a bakery, which was the people that I sent, they, uh, and they've got eight employees and I, I want to do something to help. Yeah. Um, I, I, I call Nolan, go, Nolan gave me a bunch of links and I out the links, but there's nobody really just to sit down and talk to them. And it's and a really tricky calculation. Mm -hmm. um, hey, one other odd and end that I re recognized is, um, is to um, clarify that the current open enrollment period goes through October 1st. Um, the ARPA open enrollment period. Can we be very explicit? I think it's very important for us to make that very clear here as much as we can that this is the open enrollment period for accessing the additional federal assistance, which was going to, which was scheduled to close on August 15th, and for which Vermonters can access enormous help if they're eligible uh, with premium assistance with federal dollars. And yeah. That it's been extended to October 1st. This is very important information for us to get out into the public realm. Uh, again, I, I reference some federal data that I'm asking, and I'm hoping we're much we're talking planning to have Eva come in at our next meeting and talk to us about it. But this is, I think it's just so much more important that uh, yeah. 
Well, it would be nice to know what, if any, publicity uh, is happening around that because I think we haven't seen enough of it. Yeah. And as uh, so, it, we, it, it maybe New York State has a. We see. I, I see ads on television from New York State. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, but, Vermont has. A so, so let me clarify that the ARPA subsidies will be in place for the next year, and so people who are signing up for next year's. Mm -hmm. Uh, health insurance will be eligible for it. Um, if you're direct to your your insurance carrier this year, this month, today's the nineteenth. Not, not much time left. I was going to make a make, <laughs> it, 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 if um, four, three days ago, by the fifteenth, right. you had called to switch to direct care, you would have been eligible for next month's. ARPA subsidy. Um, if you didn't, you'll lose it. You just lose it. You, you lost what could what could be a thousand, twelve hundred dollars a month for a family. Right. And so it's substantial subsidies that people that I am very afraid many many Vermonters are not taking advantage of. And um, and I and I'll be clear that it's people who are direct to carrier. Um, and I also want to be clear that the subsidies, since we're talking about out-of-pocket costs, the subsidies available to people who have had any unemployment last year, even a week of unemployment, is incredibly generous. And it covers cost-sharing subsidies as well. And so I, I, I'm just guessing that we are going to be um, we're going to be at the end of the at the end of this, looking back and shaking our heads at how many people missed those federal dollars. Can I just clarify too? Um, so, if you are direct, it's an insurance carrier, and you make a phone call to switch to direct for Vermont Healthcare, you can switch connect. You can switch your plan exactly as it is. Yes. You're not having to make any other decision other than saying. I want to move what I currently have over here so I can get my subsidy. Yeah, I, I, I al right? um, almost, okay. it, but, but close enough. I mean, there, there's the, the one little detail of overloading, but but that's the detail that- but it's an easy yep. process for yep. consumers to take, just yeah. pick up the phone and say, I want yep. to move over here yep. so I get my subsidy. Yeah. So I, I mean, I just want to know, cause I got the, I mean, it was a terrific, um, one sheet or two sheet piece that legal aid sent out that included this with a whole list of don't miss out on all these important things, which I converted into, uh, put it on our local front porch form. Mm -hmm. But this piece was only one on a list of 10. And so I, I do think it's important for a separate highlighting just of this. Yeah, in a couple of weeks ago, in insurance rate review process, we understood that 10% of direct enrollees had moved. And uh, and look, some people, the subsidy goes really high. I mean, the subsidy goes yeah. as high as it can, but with the point where it crosses the cost of the actual plan is, um, um, high 600% of, of federal poverty level. It's very high. Um, and I understand some people may look at it and say, ah, I would save $7 and 50 cents. It's not worth my trouble. Um, but for other people, we're, we're literally talking about thousand, you know, over a thousand dollars a month. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all the jumping up and down and excitement about the stimulus checks that went out, we're talking about that much a month I, or I something. There's, if there's a single thing that we can do immediately, it's to make sure that all Vermonters who are eligible access this right now, especially with feeling badly that we were meeting after the deadline of August 15th, but if the extension the deadline is, is until October but, 1st. But yes, right? but I'm just saying that so the extent it's been extended to October 1st. Yeah. And I think we should uh, we should have something that goes out to all of our colleagues yes. to highlight this with something that's already prepared to use on social media front porch form et cetera that they don't need to modify. Uh, because I think I think that that would be something immediate. That is in fact usually uh, impactful for for Vermonters and our constituents. No, well, one of the you know was it two years ago? I mean, our committee 
really dug hard to try to find a way to help this exact group of people who were on that right. cliff, yeah. um, who fell off a cliff and, and couldn't come up with something. Um, and here it is, handed to it's us on us. a silver platter. Yeah. Um, Can you send us the information that you sent out to Front Porch Forum and then... Yep. Um, we can send it out to our colleagues in the House and the Senate. Yep. Yep. And I and because I do think that is something that we could do right away, and it yep. will save Vermonters money overall and in the short will, term. And I will say the Eva website. Right. Right. We can get there too. Exactly. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for the time, and thank you for um, uh, allowing me to chat a little bit and. Um, and thank you for taking a little time to um, honor the stories that I was able to bring forward today. And um, I'm looking forward to, uh, and, and, I, and I'm open to your suggestions, each of you um, right here, um, to uh, ideas of how to share this kind of data, you know, this kind of stories uh, in a way that honors them and also, um, and, and doesn't, and, doesn't overwhelm lawmakers, or maybe it's supposed to overwhelm lawmakers, but um, um, I'd be happy to talk more and, um, and thank you. Well, thank you. And I, I think any analysis that you do have and that might inform the work that we're doing, you know, by November um, would be extremely helpful to have you come back in and see yeah. you and Meg maybe consolidate some of the work that you've done. I think Meg is with us for just a short while. Did Meg okay. leave? Um, and and then Meg okay. is moving on to a new position. Meg, you want to announce your new position? Uh oh. Some of them saw that I'm going to be working with you on Alzheimer's related issues as their new policy director, but I will be here to help Mike through the middle of September start to get this in place and and obviously support afterwards with questions since I was part of the initial. Um, collectors, and I would just say, as you're as you're really thinking about what you're hoping for from this data, what you think you need from this data, we can provide some of the um, specific breakdowns that you asked for. But the the highest value that I see from the data are these personal stories, because all the other fields were self-reported. So sometimes they would check, like I don't have insurance, and then it would say, "What's your insurance plan?" And they would say, "I'm on my employer plan." So there, the 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 other fields are going to are because it's self reporting. It's not a it's not a sample size um, that's been divvied out correctly. The most valuable information is is from the stories. And if there's things you want to hear, like I believe it was Senator Rahm. I can't tell because your picture's small, but um, that asked about like one person putting off care when another because another person is getting care, like. If we know those things, it just happened that there were two stories like that in the examples today because those were stories that had come up. But those are the kinds of things that we can be looking for as we're going through, so we can provide some numbers on those specific details. If you're, if you want to see, are you finding in a story a connection about, for instance, another one I see a lot is high deductible and the high cost of insurance. How does that compound together to make a problem? Then we could flag those and we could start getting more. Um, uh, quantitative data around those issues, but the the simple breakouts around insurance and employer, even um, even income levels, because people are reporting for their whole family, and one person in what they consider their family may be on an employer plan, and another, they may not be married, and another person may be on Medicaid. So it's just it's cloudy the way the survey is. So really think about what do you want to see from the from the stories so that we can be looking for that and flagging that um, to then come up with the data of, okay, we saw this many stories around around this. So that, that's where it really, to me, is the richest. Thank you and congratulations. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll be seeing you. I'm looking forward to that. That's one of the perks is getting to work with all of you again. All right, terrific. A couple more comments. So one, you know, when I read something like my wife prays she doesn't have seizures because my insurance wouldn't cover any of the costs. I mean, I I see a path to do something about that. I could be wrong because I'm not on the healthcare committee, but that seems horrible. You know, and I know you were saying you can only really get involved if things are 
illegal or, you know, they're kind of really outside of the realm of, of mm. what uh, should be people's experiences. But I mean, a list of things like that, you know, where there's a pretty specific policy change, I think would be really helpful. Um, you know, and then looking at things like someone said, for years, I couldn't do this. It's also, I think, helpful for us to know what, what has changed for people, what does work, mm -hmm. you know, what, when, I know that probably in healthcare can you talk a lot about when things finally work for someone, they mm -hmm. have better insurance tied to a different employer, they, you know, something, they have better income, but, you know, you said like, well, or know when someone things are working right for people but you know we also want to know when things are working yeah. for people when they might have gotten out of a bad situation because they made the right phone call I mean so much of what I hear from healthcare is I needed to know the right person to talk to to get like a magical change made in my life you know and that's the scary thing is that it's so uneven for people depending on who they talk to and you know where they look for help and I feel like really informative for us to know when someone had a positive deviance because they knew yeah. where to get help yeah it, um, it 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 reminds me something that i wanted to say and and i was just saying about you and now just one more thing in response um, um i think healthcare more than other policy areas um beware the average mm -hmm. you know it, it, you know the average cost of housing that's ah, a range of the cost of housings you know, obviously, Jeff Bezos pays more for his monthly costs than, you know, the average person. But, you know, other than that, uh, the, you know, housing has a certain range. You know, I, I don't know what the average health care spend in Vermont is, something like $1,000. You know, if you just divide the total cost by the number of people, um, you know, to a lot of people, $10,000. I was like, that's crazy. I never go to the doctor. Um, and then to a small set of people, you know, they're, they're millions. That's crazy. I spend a lot more than that, right? Exactly. But the real point is that the 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 details that go into people's lives that drive the cost um, include uh, include many many factors that um, that you just can't average. And so I, I I think whenever I hear people give averages in healthcare, I kind of like, time out. Wait, whoa, 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 this doesn't exactly work this way as it really plays out on the ground. Um, so um, there's a, a bazillion details behind each of these stories that it's um, impossible for us to really evaluate. On the face of it, um, seizure care should be covered. I don't know whether that person is high deductible. I don't know whether that person has an employer-sponsored plan that's very limited. I don't, I just, a lot I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I thank hope, you. I hope people receive some kind of response, not a personalized response, but mm. something like, this is what we heard. This is what we're able to do with it. You know, these are solutions that we can advance right now. I think people deserve yeah. some feedback when they share such a personal story. Um, well, yes. that's what we're about to do, hopefully. Well, um, yes, yeah. it is. Our, it, we really do need to reach out to the people who participated and gave us their emails, many of whom did. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I need to share a breaking news report on what? workforce and healthcare access. Uh, I just got a phone message from Central Vermont Medical Center. They have to postpone my mammogram scheduled for tomorrow because of a staffing coverage issue. There you go. So there we go. It affects everyone. Wow. Charlene, is Jen Carby on? She is on Zoom. It, Jen, are you on Zoom? There she is. I'm here. Well, I, I thought that we will, um, we should move into a review of the Act 48 principles, and then we'll have a discussion about future meetings. Sure. Do you want me to share my screen and put up uh, sure. kind of that presentation I, that either, no either one had copies made of? Either document is fine. We have the um, short version and we have the PowerPoint. So I think the PowerPoint one may be easier to look at yeah, as it's together. Um, so let me just. Um, 
Charlene, can you let me share my screen? No, no. Thank you. Okay. Can you see my screen? Can you all see the document? Yes. Yes, we can. Great. Um, and just again, I'm Jennifer Carby from Legislative Council. Um, this was a presentation I'd put together a couple of years ago when uh, the issue of the Act 48 principles came up in the House Health Care Committee, and it just seemed like an easy way to look at them. Um, so it starts off by uh, quoting from Act 48, uh, and just to note that the uh, principles are also codified in statute. That's actually the what I the one pager handout that I gave you that also has the principles on it are the ones in 18 VSA section 9371, which is the first section of the Green Mountain Care Board chapter. And there have been some amendments um, to the principles since they were initially enacted in 2011. Um, so these should include those updates. So Act 48 starts with, um, it says the General Assembly adopts the following principles as a framework for reforming healthcare in Vermont. And the first one says that the state of Vermont must ensure universal access to and coverage for high quality, medically necessary health services for all Vermonters. Systemic barriers such as cost must not prevent people from accessing necessary health care. All Vermonters must receive affordable and appropriate health care at the appropriate time in the appropriate setting. So this sort of picks up on some of those issues that Mike Fisher just highlighted for you in his presentation, I think. Um, so as far as, as uh, ass assessing where you are in achieving these. Let me know if you wanna stop on any of them, otherwise I will just go through them. Principle number two says that overall healthcare costs must be contained and growth in healthcare spending in Vermont must balance the healthcare needs of the population with the ability to pay for such care. The third principle says that the healthcare system must be transparent in design, efficient in operation and accountable to the people it serves. And the state must ensure public participation in the design, implementation, evaluation, and accountability mechanisms of the healthcare system. Principle number four, primary care must be preserved and enhanced so that Vermonters have care available to them, preferably within their own communities. The healthcare system must ensure that Vermonters have access to appropriate mental health care that meets uh, the Institute of Medicine's triple aims of quality, access, and affordability, and that is equivalent to other components of healthcare as part of an integrated, uh, sorry, integrated holistic system of care. And just to note that the Institute of Medicine reference was actually not accurate. That's been changed in legislation since then. So the, the hard copy, the one pager that I gave you um, has slightly different language there. Other aspects of Vermont's healthcare infrastructure, including the educational and research missions of the state's academic medical center and other post-secondary educational institutions, the nonprofit missions of the community hospitals and the critical access designation of rural hospitals must be supported in such a way that all Vermonters, including those in rural areas, have access to necessary health services and that these health services are sustainable. The fifth principle is that every Vermonter should be able to choose his or her health care providers. Number six, Vermonters should be aware of the costs of the health care services yeah, they receive. Yeah, yes. Hold up. Yeah, there's a question. Go ahead. I mean, I just could just be me, but I don't find it that helpful to just read these without like stopping to say, are we, be are we measuring the, like, what are we doing right now? Are we just making <laughs> Let's go through them okay. first and then we'll come back. Okay. To, that's a longer conversation, but you know, yeah, much, much longer. But for example, we do have provisions that allow people to pick their providers, but, but we will, 
we'll come back to, to that question unless somebody has a, a specific statement to make. Go ahead, Jen. Okay, um, so number six is Vermonters should be aware of the costs of the health services they receive and costs should be transparent and easy to understand. So just as, a, just as an aside to answer um, Senator Hinsdale's question, the transparency issue passed legislation last session on um, increasing hospital cost transparency and there's the, that's, that is still be, being worked on. Also insurance company um, transparency to demonstrate the costs of services and then the payment for services. So we don't measure if Vermonters pay the costs of transparency to understand. We don't measure what Vermonters think. We, I mean, we don't know if it's easy to understand. Oh, well, the only way we can know if it's easy and right is to look at it and, and determine do we have a comparative analysis of all the hospitals for uh, a colonoscopy, for example. So, so then it, you start to get into more specific details. And in some cases, we meet the criteria. In other cases, we do not meet the criteria. But so it gets to be more complicated but, than that. But there's no formal process. Right. There's no. That anyone who goes back to this okay. and has measured it. Okay. There's no, no form. My government accountability can be right. Exactly. Like, what is well, that? Yeah, exactly. What are we doing? <laughs> well, but, and I have, I, have a, I have a general question, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait till the end. Okay. Because okay. I think it's important because Act 48 gets brought up Right, in right. many, many right. contexts and for many purposes. And I think it's important for us to understand, and maybe Jen can help us with this later, what, how okay. this sits in statute and what is the Point. intent of it in terms of- I just didn't know if I was missing something you all have. No. You, you're no. not Michigan. Okay. Go ahead, Jen. Yep, principle number seven is that individuals have a personal responsibility to maintain their own health and to use health resources wisely. And all individuals should have a financial stake in the health services they receive. Principle number eight, the healthcare system must recognize the primacy of the relationship between patients and their healthcare practitioners, respecting the professional judgment of healthcare practitioners and the informed decisions of patients. Number, whoops, sorry. Number nine, Vermont's health delivery system must seek continuous improvement of healthcare quality and safety and of the health of the population and promote healthy lifestyles. The system therefore must be evaluated regularly for improvements in access, quality and cost containment. Number 10, Vermont's healthcare system must include mechanisms for containing all system costs and eliminating unnecessary expenditures, including by reducing administrative costs and by reducing costs that do not contribute to efficient, high quality health services or improve health outcomes. Efforts to reduce overall healthcare costs should identify sources of excess cost growth. Number 11, the financing of healthcare in Vermont must be sufficient, fair, predictable, transparent, sustainable, and shared equitably. Number 12, the system must consider the effects of payment reform on individuals and on healthcare professionals and suppliers. It must enable healthcare professionals to provide on a solvent basis, effective and efficient health services that are in the public interest. Number 12 is that Vermont's healthcare system must operate as a partnership between consumers, employers, healthcare professionals, hospitals, and the state and federal government. And finally, number 14 is that state government must ensure that the healthcare system satisfies the principles expressed in this section. And then I think at the time we'd been looking at some statutory references to the Act 48 principles. So to the extent that this uh, kind of goes to what Representative Lippert wanted to get into, um, where these come up. 
The Green Mountain Care Board is directed to execute its duties consistent with the Act 48 principles. The board also has to review and approve the statewide health information technology plan to ensure that the necessary infrastructure is in place to enable the state to achieve the Act 48 principles. And the board's annual report has to identify how the board's work comports with the Act 48 principles. There's also some language about the Act 48 principles in the Green Mountain Care Board payment reform pilots language, expressing legislative intent to achieve those principles. Um, and qualifications for nominees to the Green Mountain Care Board. The nominating committee must assess the candidates using specific criteria, including their commitment to those Act 48 principles. Uh, comes up in the health resource allocation plan that in developing that document, the HRAP, uh, the Green Mountain Care Board must consider the Act 48 principles. It also comes up in the all payer model that in order to implement an all payer model, the Green Mountain Care Board and the Agency of Administration must ensure that the model maintains consistency with the Act 48 principles. And then there was obviously an additional reference to it in the Green Mountain Care Implementation Statute for the single payer system. So I can take that down if that would be helpful. There you have it. But state, but so as you're talking about the, the role of state government in overseeing the uh, uh, being having accountability for ensuring that we meet the principles. So most of that responsibility lies with the Green Mountain Care Board. I think certainly some of it lies with the Green Mountain Care Board and their enabling language, but the the specifics in that last principle are really a state government. It's not limited to the Green Mountain Care Board who must ensure that the system satisfies those principles. So I think as you've moved, for example, uh, the director of healthcare reform into the agency of administration, there is a role for them to play as well and others. Uh, um, and then through any of our waivers analysis, uh, if we're looking at quality metrics, so that which we're not going to be talking about too much in here, but um that falls into v cures or other whether we don't have another metric that is the state metric at this point i guess i'm not clear on on well i'm just thinking about going with that piece assessment of quality we also have the department of health that looks at um our health outcomes. So in terms of individuals accepting responsibility, and so the Department of Health looks at the, the youth risk behavior survey, for example, or the incidence of different types of cancers or cardiovascular disease, which would be an indicator of overall health um, and personal risk, theoretically could be traced to personal responsibility. But we don't have a direct, there's not a direct line to that. It's just simply that that's the role of the Department of Health in identifying some of that information and data. And there's nothing in here about diversity either. Go ahead. Right. Sure. I think it's been a few years since this was all put together. And when I look at it, we talk about the relationship between professionals and, and patients. We talk about the system. We do some reference in here to infrastructure. And underlying all of this is the people doing the work. And we're desperate now for primary care doctors. We're desperate for nurses. We're desperate for mental health professionals. And there's no place in this that clearly to me just states that and it's we're support. doing across the board scholarships loan repayments all yeah. sorts of stuff but somehow in it though we're in a crisis of medical professionals and that's not it it's danced around but not said you're right i mean it does talk about the relationship with professionals and, and patients it, but it doesn't talk about the state responsibility for ensuring any kind of 
Well, the HRAP does somewhat of that. Yeah, we dance but, around it. But all. yeah, you're right. But in you're terms right. of having a having an adequate and uh, professional healthcare uh, workforce, yeah. not there. And and so there is they, there is we, some of it. And go ahead. But that's not to say we aren't doing some of that loan repayment and scholarships, right. but it doesn't we dance around it? We're doing a lot. Yes, we're doing but it's a lot. Not, it's not the result of any principle that has that been put in place. Yep. Jen, what did you want to add? Well, there is some of that embedded in number four, which talks about um, other aspects of Vermont's healthcare infrastructure, including the educational and research missions of the Academic Medical Center and other post-secondary educational institutions oh, yeah. and other things um, must be supported in a, such a way that all Vermonters have access to necessary healthcare services. I think it's looking at it specifically in the kind of the access side, but recognizing the role of the post-secondary institutions. So, in touch it. Yeah, and I was, I, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because when I was looking at our reading principle number one, in my head, I said systematic barriers such as cost and healthcare workforce must not, you know, prevent people from seeking care. Yeah, that's where it belongs, and it's right. Yeah. Don't. But I may also just draw a distinction between principle and goal. When you create a goal, you create something that's measurable. When you create a principle, it's sort of foundation of things to be blind for when you move forward. Principles were designed to sort of, as you build a single player system, as you move forward, these are the things you need to be blind for. If we're trying to create something that we want to measure, then we would create goals and put forth ways to measure. It's kind of how. Healthcare model as you know, here's our goal, and then here's how we're going to measure. So, before we go down the rabbit hole, that are you measurable? I would one of them. Well, I'd like to pick up on that because that, that's part of what I was wanting to say earlier. Because I think, because uh, I wasn't on healthcare when Act 48 was passed. Was. Uh, some some of us were. Uh, mm -hmm. I was not. I would just, I would just say, and, so, and there's a difference between when you're in the room, in the committee that's you know, really wrestling with this. And, uh, and I have always, and, and, and subsequently in the many now number of years um, working directly on healthcare, Act 48 gets brought up. Sometimes it gets brought up, frankly, in a, in a, as, a, as a goal. As a goal, sometimes it gets brought up as a cudgel. Uh, it's like we're not, Vermont's not living up to Act 48. And other ways, other times it's brought up in, in other ways. I, I have interpreted these principles of Act 48 as aspirational. That's, mm -hmm. that's the phrase, I, that's the word I put on them. That they're, uh, and I think, Nolan, that's, I think that's kind of what you're describing. They're, they're principles to guide us as we move toward where we want to be. But uh, I think that, uh, so that, so I just put that there. I, I think the principles are aspirational and they're not just for us to, not that we shouldn't measure and think about how we're trying to get there, but they're not, they're not to be measured in the same way. I, I do have another question, and maybe this isn't the right time and place, but it's something I've been wanting to bring up for some time. And that is Act 48 also, it gets quoted as saying that Vermont should provide as a public good, publicly financed healthcare coverage for all Vermont residents. Now that's, quote, that's quotes that other people provide. And, and I think it's, also important for us when we talk about Act 48, what is it? And somebody's like, well, we want to live up to Act 48. And that's a different part of Act 48. It's not the principles of Act 48. And Jen, I don't know if you can help make us to just help us distinguish between you know what parts of Act 48 are statutory expectations and which are so just just one comment that Act 48 does say that health care is a public good. That is a statement in Act 48. And I don't I don't know exactly where it is in the so that's actually what I'm looking at right now. So it, the phrase public good is used three times in Act 48 itself. The first is in section one, which is the intent section, and it starts with saying it is the intent of the General Assembly to create Green Mountain Care, which was the name of the so-called single payer um, program, 
uh, to contain costs and to provide as a public good, comprehensive, affordable, high quality, publicly financed healthcare coverage for all Vermonters, and it goes on. Um, so that's the first place where it's the intent to create Green Mountain Care um, to contain costs and to provide as a public good, this comprehensive health care. The second is in the purpose statement at the beginning of the subchapter in Title 33, Chapter 18, Subchapter 2 on Green Mountain Care. The purpose of Green Mountain Care is to provide as a public good, comprehensive, affordable, high quality, publicly financed health care coverage. Um, and the third place it comes up is in the qualification for, it's a little bit different context, qualification for nominees for the Green Mountain Care Board, and that's um, regard for the public good sort of more generally. So the public good is really seems to be, healthcare as a public good here seems to be in the context of creating Green Mountain Care to provide that as a public good. I mean, just, I'm not arguing that a principle is different than a goal, but principle nine says the system must be evaluated regularly for improvements in access quality and cost containment. Principle two seems to be our charge. I mean, principle two says healthcare costs must be contained in growth and healthcare spending and Vermont must balance the healthcare needs of the population with the ability to pay for such care. Whether it's a principle or not, if we agree with that, we have to have a way of measuring it. Otherwise, it's irrelevant. So I'm just... Like this feels like a kind of mental exercise otherwise, unless we are trying to understand how we want to live up to that principle in our in our next four meetings. And what information we have. Well, so well, we would have to to look and as you said, we'd have to look at all the information that we have, all this all the laws that we pass to support each of the that would support each of the principles. I think um, what we might want to do, and we'll have to think about this, we, we might want to consider what do we need further to demonstrate that we are achieving the goals and meeting the um, spirit of the, within the principles. So that, that, that's a separate, it's a separate question. If we start, if we start going through this and suggesting that um, we establish um, metrics for each one of the principles, that that'll become everything that we are doing here. We we'll have to we finish it by December. Well, right. That that statement must be evaluated. I think you're right. There there yeah. are a lot of pieces. Where we are, we do have metrics we are evaluating. That's what we need to kind of refresh our memories, identify yeah. um, from all those existing reports. That but it could be a recommendation that that happen more thoroughly yes. going forward. Um, otherwise, um, that's what we'll we'll be here. So, Cal's been happy. Under the option you could create goals. When I say goals, yeah. goals mm -hmm. like five, X amount of time, X amount of Vermont will know. That's how you measure the goals. Well, it's like, measure, yeah. We'll measure it by any good program. So, but if, yeah, and if you look at number nine, number nine um, already in some ways, is as there are goals for number nine that are developed through the Department of Health for the reduction of substance use disorder, the reduction of uh, smoking, uh, and the reduction of uh, cardiovascular disease associated with. We all hear a lot of that. Yeah, they have goals for mental health, behavioral health. So, um, well, yeah, so we don't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that we can go through and identify all of the goals, but we might suggest that there are goals associated with each of the principles and that those should be maybe further developed. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe in a more formalized way, because when I think about all of these things, I think, yes, I've worked on a lot of legislation that supported each of those goals, mm -hmm. but maybe not systematically. That's, yeah, it kind of, yeah. there's a lot of scattered things that a lot of stuff to going on that pulled together yeah. more clearly. Yeah. Which ones are in support of which? Yes. And yeah. And what's missing? Uh, any other questions for Jen on the principles or comments? Okay. But review this again, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> nice truck. I no. thought we just did all of our work. <laughs> no. All right. Well, we already we we sort of have what we'll do at our next meeting, right? Two, yeah. three, and five, and we have some witnesses identified, but I think. Primarily, we want to, um, if at all possible, meet with our consultant. No, I'd like to take the notes of the different things that we brought in. Good. Okay. All right. So the question is, we have a total of five meetings. This is number one. Um, and then we have... September, October, November, December. So we've got, we have Perfect. four months. <laughs> huh? four we four have months. four meetings in four months. And, and then we have an opportunity to complete our work. So, so, so December would be the time where we would have to review our draft recommendations and make them final because mm -hmm. we won't meet again before January 15th. So take doing that calculus, we would have our draft recommendations in November, which means that September and October become the heavy lift for us mm -hmm. and part of November. So we probably don't want to meet again unless we have right. So September. Um, what's the best way to do this? Do you want, would you like Charlene to send a doodle poll out? <laughs> Rather than sitting here. Yeah, that, that's yeah. what I was going to say. Available. Yes, I'm available. I think, I think a doodle poll would be really helpful. And so what, Charlene. today's the 19th of August? Yes, it is. Charlene, yes. Do you want me to send one for the next meeting or four? Four. 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 Yes, December. And you want to take the dates? Or? Well, yeah, I was thinking the dates that are not LCAR Thursdays might work. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't know. The dates that are not justice oversight, the or dates that are not that are not Green Mountain Care Child Board protection um, nominating committee. The dates that are not Green Mountain Care Board. So there's, what is it? Joint fiscal committee. So start, I think start by those and see, what, there's anything left. see what's left. Okay. Do you want it to be looking for the second half of the month? Yes. I think we should be looking for the second half of September because we have yeah. a lot of things to do between now and then. Yeah. A lot of prep work, hopefully, consult. consulting. Yeah. I can tell you September 30th and October 1st are not. Okay. Not good for you. Yeah. Well, so those are the Green Mountain Care, Care Board nominating committee. Okay. Are you on that committee with me? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's, That's a great matter. idea. Okay. <laughs> okay. Did you hear what Nolan was suggesting that we each send days that don't work to Charlene oh, and see if there are a day that it works that, you know. She could do it. Go ahead. 
are of doodle pool. Yep, I know. We'll do that. I think ideally, if we looked at after September 15th. It's really common, especially with a big charge, that they aren't good at all the things. And I'm particularly worried about understanding disparities and trends about where resources might go to tackle disparities. And I know that there's a lot of new, um, you know, groups led more by BIPOC folks and other people who are really emerging in that space of health equity. And I wonder if it's if, if it's if you're going to be considering that they might need to subcontract part of their work or really not treat that particularly like an afterthought and not have any expertise in that, but build it in. What I can say is that in our process, 